Very good morning to you. Monday the 11th of November. Hope everyone had a fantastic weekend. Um, usual drill for this morning, Monday. We're going to talk about the calendar, as you can see to the side of me. What are the main events for the week ahead? Where are the potential fundamental catalysts that could create some direction for markets? Because there's certainly quite a few things coming out. Uh, one thing not to forget is actually Veteran Day's holiday in the US. So US markets are closed today. So do take that under consideration in terms of your view and your strategies for this session in particular. Uh, likely to be pretty quiet as we get through into later into the afternoon European time. Um, but just before I go into the calendar and the other things we're going to cover, because we're going to have a look at Trump, the US-China trade war. We're going to have a look at some Spanish election results, uh, a UK outlook downgrade that came late last week, and then an update on the general election polls. Uh, is what's on the agenda from my side before then Sam comes on uh, and looks through the charts more technically. Uh, but looking at the market open, how are things looking and shaping up? Well, uh, not too much reaction overall. I mean, there, there are certainly some headlines, as I said, to go over. Uh, not also without mentioning the, the violence continuing in Hong Kong, which has seen their local stock market fall at one point uh, in excess of 3%. But the actual open as far as the assets that we're looking at here uh, across the kind of FX commodity and the fixed income markets is, is pretty quiet actually. Uh, a little bit negative in the equity index futures however we're already pushing off the lowest levels. Uh, the DAX and the center left did have a brief test of this S2 before then just bouncing back. Um, Spanish banks a little softer. Uh, the squawk was just saying at the market open uh, as we've just gone through eight o'clock and the cash open, just given the result of the, again, the kind of hung parliament situation that's developing in Spain. So it's even got worse for the socialist leader than what it was in the first place. Uh, it's kind of backfired in a much a Theresa May-esque style. Um, but overall, gold pretty flat, treasuries minor positive. So if anything, uh, just very moderate risk off uh, to the general asset class mix. Uh, what I mean by that is equities and oil touch lower, T-notes and gold touch higher, kind of reflecting that, that point of view. The currency markets, though, the Dixie is flat at the moment, uh, so not really showing any, any way in much meaningful direction as yet. Um, so let's go over the headlines, then we'll kind of bring all this back into the calendar of what's to look out for. And the first thing I want to talk about is an update on where we are with the US-China trade talks. You'll remember last week we're touching all-time highs. There was this kind of uh, this positive pricing in of a partial trade deal uh, elevated even further by the idea of the US agreeing as per what the Chinese press was stating of the rolling back of tariffs. Now, remember what we were saying at the end of last week, we were a little bit more pessimistic about the view of Donald Trump actually um, concluding that matter as to um, fulfilling the request of China. And that pretty much played out to be the case at the weekend. Uh, Trump spoke and the president said that trade talks with China are moving on very nicely and that leaders in Beijing wanted to do a deal much more than I do. Uh, Trump also described as incorrect reports about how much the US were ready to roll back tariffs on China. So I don't find any of this particularly surprising. Um, as we've said before, I think Trump definitely wants to assert himself and make sure that he is in control of this negotiation process. He also wants to appease his domestic base by remaining quite firm uh, on the issue. So even though there's no smoke without fire, and I do believe that inevitably in time tariffs will be either frozen or rolled back in order to keep the stock market where it needs to be this time next year for the election, for the moment, I think Trump doesn't really need to do too much because if you think about it, he's already done the job. Stocks are at record highs and he's managed to fire away several tweets last week saying that exact same fact. So if anything, he's kind of achieved his point. So now he doesn't even need to do a deal. He just needs to prolong it and then do it later by himself a little bit more time in, in my mind. So that's the latest there. Trump is speaking um, on Tuesday. I think it's the New York Economic Club speech that the president gives on a yearly basis. That normally acts as a pretty decent platform for the president to say his latest thinking about a variety of different issues. 
but of course that would be one uh, that the market will remain particularly sensitive to. And I would say despite all the economic um, data that we'll look at on the calendar for the week ahead, it still remains one of the key catalysts for market sentiment and direction. So any updates that we get on the trade front need to be, uh, you need to remain vigilant for. Otherwise, quick look around the globe. And as I briefly mentioned, China overnight, um, well, I should say more specifically, Hong Kong, the Hang Seng Stock Index, uh, saw a significant dip. I'm sure you've probably seen the viral videos already this morning when you've come in, but two protesters shot at point blank range by a police officer uh, overnight. I believe one is dead. Uh, and it's one of the first times that the violence has kind of spilled out into the actual daytime rather than the usual, usual nighttime protests. So continuation of violence, if almost escalating uh, at the moment, has seen their stock market come under significant pressure. Uh, hasn't really come into our market. And, and in a sense, the way I'd look at this, if you're trading kind of Western uh, American European products, is that I wouldn't anticipate this Chinese story, even though it's getting worse there domestically, to really impact our markets, not unless uh, China forcefully starts to make more meaningful developments with military occupation within Hong Kong, which I think is still highly unlikely at this point. Um, Or what if one of the US administration, as per Mike Pence, the VP, did two weeks ago, comes out and says something quite critical of the mainland, Beijing, about their dealing with the situation developing in Hong Kong, could that be a catalyst for the ongoing, what has been more positive trade talks to break down once again if the US were made to make an inappropriate comment on such a sensitive subject for the Chinese authorities. So they're the two things probably I'd look out for if this is going to move our markets uh, in that respect. The other thing in Europe, so coming a bit closer to home, uh, Spain held an election over the weekend and it came just only six months after they had a previous election. Now why did the socialist leader call that? Well, his party in the previous election had gone from 85 to 123 seats in the 100 or the 350 seat chamber that comprises of Spanish parliament. Now, he thought that given the way things were going, that he could call another election on the premise that he could he could solidify a majority government because of the difficulties experiencing in trying to get a coordinated coalition. Now, uh, Podemos, the anti-austerity party, was the party that's been propping up the socialist party, just given the number of seats within that chamber in Spanish Parliament. Together, though, given the results that have come out so far, they've lost 11 seats between them on Sunday, leaving them now 21 short of a majority, meaning that they are going to have to team up with some of the kind of smaller fringe parties to get a working Uh, majority to run government. So again, as I said right at the beginning, it's kind of reminiscent of Theresa May where everything was looking so positive, it's felt like a good strategic move to call a snap election, only for that to be the absolute um, worst decision and a big backfiring on the government. And it's now they're in a weaker position than they've ever been in. Now, the point being though, as I said, the way it works, much like any uh, democracy, is that because the Socialist Party and Pedro Sanchez has the most votes. He does get first um, first rights of reserve, if you like, to try and form a government. Um, the biggest winner of the election, and this is something, of course, that's been re- very reminiscent of European politics and the emergence of more right-leaning parties. The biggest winner on the night was a party called the Vox, which is a Spanish nationalist group. They've made the biggest headway uh, most recently through these recent elections in Spain. Um, So, yeah, more difficulties, I would say, Uh, a more fragmented parliament. It means that this political impasse in Spain is likely to continue for the foreseeable future. Uh, And that is putting some of the domestic stocks in Spain in the Spanish Ibex under a bit of pressure this morning. But again, seemingly still a, a fairly isolated situation for Spain hasn't really seeped into Um, general broader market um, sentiment at the moment and I don't really anticipate that it would at this point because 
Uh, I think the Spanish political mess has been evident for some time and it's looking like it's going to be set to continue for the foreseeable future. Moving on, I'm going to talk Brexit briefly. Um, this was an interesting graphic that I shared at the weekend. Not sure if you did see it. So just to quickly recap, this is a graphic of cable, pound, dollar, and it's looking at a latest Bloomberg survey of 12 participants, i.e. 12 different banks, and their view about where would the pound against the dollar be on the outcome of different election scenarios. So the first one, the top one being a Tory majority, which is the baseline expectation. Remember, the broader market consensus is still that Boris will capture a majority government. Um, the poll then at the weekend suggesting that's a 40% probability. So it's by no means an outright expectation. It's just the highest of all the possible options. Now, if a Tory majority were to happen, uh, the average estimate is then, bearing in mind the um, cable in terms of the futures this morning, so the spot not too far away from the price is trading around 128. A Tory majority, they say, would hit 134, i.e. then it gives Boris the, the greatest chance of being able to push through his deal in Parliament and get relevant backing to move into the implementation transitional phase of Brexit. Um, a Tory coalition could be then still sterling positive, albeit only marginally. A Labour coalition, uh, the same but in reverse. And each one of those scenarios is seen at roughly circa 25 to 30 percent probability. A Labour coalition would be 127. And one of the thinkings here is that in a coalition, even though then um, that would lead to some positive developments potentially around a softer Brexit. What you're trying to do then is lessen the power of which Jeremy Corbyn would have, which would be uh, a Labour majority, the worst um, case for the pound, is what the banks think. Uh, even though it's the lowest probability, only 5% chance of happening, just given the fact that we want to renationalize a lot of the companies, increase corporation tax, these kind of socialist led policies. Uh, huge, monumental size government spending, which, you know, if you actually think about it, Moody's at the end of last week lowered their UK credit outlook to negative on Brexit paralysis and has made policy making less predictable. Um, this comes as well as S&P and Fitch, they already have the UK country on negative watch. Also, there was comments about the fact that they're moving away from more austerity and fiscal prudence because political parties, including the Conservatives, but more radical under Labour, want to significantly increase government borrowing, which given the situation with the negative outlook politically emanating from Brexit and the uncertainties that that would have on its potential outcome, um, it wouldn't be surprising to see sovereign downgrades to the UK. And so hence the reason why a uh, Corbyn-led majority would be the most negative. Um, the one thing I think that was quite interesting, though, when you actually look at the access on the right-hand side of this graphic, um, the actual response to the general election here, you can see, is relatively small, I thought. Bearing in mind cables trading at 128, the worst-case scenario they see trading at 123, the best-case scenario they see trading at 134. So either way, um, I would say that's way more tame than certainly we have seen on some of the other big political occasions. But um, obviously these are just forecasts, the proof will be in the pudding, and we've still got a few weeks to go until we actually get the general election. Um, one thing then with the general election, what's the current status with the opinion polls? And my overall summary would be that um, nothing is really changing at this point in time. The ruling Conservatives still have a pretty decent lead um, so just running you through a couple of the headlines, the Conservatives had 41% support compared to 29% for Labour in the opinion poll uh, published on Saturday in the Observer. So that's down just 1% for the Tories, um, Labour up a touch. The Lib Dems are third at 15%. Um, the YouGov poll for the Sunday Times showed Conservatives at 39%, so that's unchanged from the prior week. Uh, the Conservatives maintained a 12 percentage point lead over Labour from last week according to the Delta Poll National Opinion Survey in the Mail. And the BMG survey for the Independent on Sunday put the Tories on 37, Labour 29, the Lib Dems on 16, Brexit Party on 9%. So all in all, 
despite a lot of the noises being made as they've been ramping up their kind of domestic policy pledges to try and create, um, I, I guess, public opinion to, to side with them for the election, it's having very little to really move the needle as far as the polls are concerned for the time being. So all, thing, all things remain equal for, for now. Moving on, um, just want to talk about the calendar then, because uh, as I've already mentioned, on Tuesday you're going to get President Trump talking at the, the New York Economic Club. Um, so again, it's going to be key for what does he say about not just domestic policy, but this broader ongoing trade war that's going on with China at the moment. But then there's another chap in this photo, and that is Mr. Jerome Powell. And it's a big week for Mr. Powell, but not just him, for a number of his Fed colleagues as well. Now on Wednesday, uh, Fed Chair Powell addresses the Congressional Joint Economic Committee, and then he appears again on Thursday talking to um, House Representatives. Now this is where he'll give his kind of update on what's the current um, economic conditions, and he kind of gives further details as towards why the Fed is doing what it's doing. And it's one of the first times he's spoken since the Fed opted to cut rates for the third time we saw, what, two weeks ago. Uh, so this will be the chance for politicians to really grill the Fed chair. So not expecting a great deal, but as you can see, there's outside of those two events between Trump and Powell, there is a whole slew of Fed speakers. So today you've got Eric Rosengren, tomorrow Patrick Harker and Neil Kashkari, who will be an FOMC voter in 2020. And then Thursday, you get a whole dump of speakers, Clarida, Evans, uh, Daly, Williams and Bullard all speaking. So for me, interesting, again, if you know your central bank strategy, this is kind of the 101 of how uh, someone like the US tend to operate. Given the potential significance and importance of the Powell speech on Wednesday, what the Fed often do is they litter in a whole group of speakers the day after as a kind of insurance policy, just in case the market misinterprets what Powell says. Powell can't afford to come out and recorrect that stance himself because that would diminish his credibility. So instead, to get ahead of that, they just list a whole load of speeches just in case. Okay, let's go back to the calendar. What else is there today? Um, as I mentioned originally, it is the Veterans Day holiday. So electronic trade will be open, but on shortened hours. Uh, but the bond market is closed in terms of the actual cash. Uh, if I just quickly jump over to the calendar, um, I'll see if those guys are on the squawk can put together some kind of um, holiday schedule. I mean, on their calendar, it says it's a non-market holiday but I'm pretty sure I read this morning that the bond market is in fact closed. Uh, I assume then that the New York Stock Exchange is open as per usual, but it might well lead to lower trading volumes. Um, otherwise, moving forward beyond, well, before I do beyond today, we've got UK uh, preliminary GDP coming out a bit later this morning. So just a quick look on the calendar, what is expected. So we'll just blow this up so you can see a bit more clearly. Uh, 9.30, the data coming out. So the three-month and three-month figure expected uh, a 0.1 increase from the prior reading at 0.4%, the year-on-year year at 0.9%. So not that I think this data is going to be particularly market-moving, but obviously you're likely to hear lots of politicians talking about this, given the fairly lackluster growth conditions, uh, likely to give opposition parties plenty of ammunition to go at the government. Tuesday then, what have we got? Well, actually, from the UK, not only do we get the preliminary GDP report for Monday, we get UK jobs data Tuesday, so that does include average earnings, employment change, claim account rate, and unemployment rate. You then get UK CPI on Wednesday, and then you get UK retail sales, I think is also coming out this week, yeah, on Thursday. So you get the full plethora of top tier one economic data points out of the UK. Um, once again, if you are a sterling trader, I think just uh, an overall consideration that still, given the political backdrop, unless those numbers are, are wildly out of line, um, I'd be looking for them more to just kind of add to general market direction and to supplement that view fundamentally rather than to be a real distinct catalyst of, of price movement in that respect. Um, moving on, Wednesday, what other things have you got? Well, there are some interesting US data points coming out as well this week. Wednesday, you get US CPI data alongside, as I mentioned, 
Jerome Powell speaking at the Joint Economic Committee, giving his testimony. Uh, you then get from the U.S. as well on Friday, U.S. retail sales, empire state manufacturing and industrial manufacturing production. So from the major U.S. data, really, and speaker events, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, um, that's really the key. So very much just given the market holiday as well today in the States, it's going to be a second half of the week where it's going to be more interesting. Uh, so again, be mindful of that. Uh, and the landscape of where the market volume and activity is likely to lie for the rest of this week beyond today. Uh, Chinese data, you've got um, industrial production coming out of China um, Wednesday night going into Thursday, also jobs update, so looking out for Aussie fluctuation overnight Wednesday night uh, for any potential movement. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So some quite interesting things coming out, uh, of course. You've also got um, European preliminary GDP coming out, the German one coming out on Thursday in particular of interest uh, to give a bit of a reference point of where we're at at the moment in terms of the severity of the downturn being experienced in the Eurozone. So overall, quite a few things to keep an eye out for. Um, so from a top level, as a reminder, looking out for any further updates on the trade side, I think we're pretty much aware of the status at the moment. There seemingly is a deal in the offing. However, Trump just looking to kind of just dial back a little bit the markets maybe overtly optimistic expectations of when it will exactly get done but the idea is it will get done he's just kind of prolonging it to manage the situation in his favor i would say um, then u.s major data fed speakers all coming from really wednesday onward uk data dropped throughout the week um, and these are kind of the main things to look out for earning season is all but pretty much done now um, so there's nothing really to look out for on that regard. Okay, that's it from me. Uh, you can grab this calendar. Um, just go on my Twitter account below. There's my handle. Uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to the channel as well for further updates throughout the week. But I'll hand you over to Sam, and he can talk you over the charts now in more detail. Thanks very much. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I hope uh, we've all had a good weekend, uh, better than Arsenal's uh, anyway. Have a, a quick look over the DAX to, to start things off, which is having a, a decent little push over the last hour, half hour. Um, certainly from pushing low towards the S1, you can see a decent uh, reaction from uh, that area. If we draw a line actually getting through uh, Thursday's low, and now we're back above the, the Asian session level of resistance. It'll be interesting to see if we can confirm a break above that which it is looking like we're, we're giving it a good go um, so equities in Europe anyway um, nice little nice little start to the week I guess potentially later on whether that be today or uh, in the week it's worth having this trend on here you can see from Thursday to Friday to Friday evening uh, a decent well respected level um, of, of a trend line and, and I've definitely had looked to have that on the the high that we've making now all be choppy as well as it's not a bad little line in the sand previous lows of friday uh, before a little false break and it's acting as a bit of resistance now so a couple resistance levels where we're trading now the trend line uh, to the upside uh, as well the lows uh, obviously other than the low the, the, the day you're looking back down towards last week and and here i would say this is a key level line in, uh, in the sand for for the buyers to hold this week if uh, we are to remain elevated up at these levels if that was to go it wouldn't be the most surprising thing in the world to see a, a, a decent push lower in stocks after a really good day last monday you can see here from the weekend whew, big push and that wasn't just in european stocks obviously we had that uh, more so uh, in in the us which uh, here's the fourth uh where's the fourth i'm up there yeah that's what I'm saying. We're trying to see where the weekend began. Uh, a decent move higher there, and we're up at obviously these all-time highs. Uh, so, like the the DAX, worth getting on a potential trend line to see if that is to hold. Uh, and the low of the morning goes back to those highs that we had from the SIP. Bit bit tricky, I think, to to predict where the S&P is going to go this week, as trade talks are going to be that main driver. Unfortunately, starting to perhaps get a trend from those lows. Didn't quite make it now, but just uh, on the idea that we might start to get squeezed in from, from both directions is something that I'd be focusing on, maybe waiting for uh, that overall to, to break either way before getting a decent move 
uh, as well. Uh, if we were to break to the downside, a couple key points that I would have keeping an eye on 30, 53, the high, which was obviously that trend channel high from the 30, if we retested it on the first of the month. Uh, so that would be a, an important point. And of course, if we are to push higher today and break that trend line, worth keeping an eye on the futures anyway at 3,100, uh, which would be the first time we ever test that point uh, incredibly. Uh, having a look over to currency, uh, the pound obviously drifted lower last week, still a nice looking trend from those recent highs that we've had, really nicely well respected. You can see from the beginning of the month, so something I would absolutely look to have on a break of that trend, obviously just then being aware of all these highs here on the hourly chart that I'd be keeping uh, a watch on. Lower in the time frame down as well. We had a, a decent, yeah, there we go. It was well respected from those lows from Friday evening. Uh, so I keep this on from an intraday perspective. But the pound last week, it has to be said, was you know relatively quiet, even though we had obviously a, a good move uh, following the... Uh, the rate decision each other day was was pretty range about not much going on and unless we do get some serious developments uh, I wouldn't be looking to go too aggressive on this market and on today of all days but this trend line to the downside and upside uh, is something uh, that I would have marked up for the euro similar in in that push lower and just going to put this on a, a 240 we sort of had the the same thing that we've had all year. We have uh, a trend line to the upside, while albeit it was relatively choppy on, on the break. You can see when, maybe if we have it this way, it looks a bit clearer. Uh, you have a decent recovery like we did from the 1st of October. It then breaks and we can then have a, a look and start talking about maybe making a new low for the year. Well, that's the way it's gone this year anyway. The low that we've uh, got in mind, I would say here, looking at the low of that 15th, almost reaching it today, a decent level of support to, to bear in mind a, a break and close below there uh, could well see a further leg down to the upside and looking more 15 minute um, I'll just be keeping a watch on any of these retracement points you know the the second test maybe of this 11060 level which was the low of Thursday as well as an area to keep an eye on but you can see when we do certainly over the last two trading days when we break these lows we're coming back to test them later on. So patience for the euro. I wouldn't be one to, to get up and chase. And potentially, you've got to say later on, if we break these two levels here, you know, coming back to, to retest that in a couple of days could be a, a decent little opportunity to keep an eye on there. I'm going to look over at gold, flirting near the, the high of the day, but uh, just struggling to, to really break through. Nothing doing yet. <laughs> We're still relatively early on in, in the day, of course, and expecting a relatively quiet one. Interesting levels, I have to say, maybe up towards that R1, 1469 looks pretty key. Uh, and then I probably would have on a trend line from those lows, but really looking here more so into the, the back end of the session before wanting to really get involved in it. Monday morning, obviously not expecting too much to happen. Looking at this on that longer term chart, let me just remove all the pivots. Uh, let's put this on the daily chart and you can see just where we're trading now really key point we did close below there though it has to be said so on you know starting on a, a sunday evening 11 o'clock le electronic trade it, it looks relatively bearish uh, on the fact that we have closed below this ultimately very key level so can the bears take over and is this now we're literally where we're trading a really really good opportunity to get short uh, we'll have to, to wait and see uh, on the idea that it's a false break if we close back above 1466 could then well become a level uh, for, for the bulls to take over. Key level to the upside be looking at these previous lows that we broke through on that magic 1482 level. Uh, if we're to hold where we are trading now, uh, I don't see much stopping us uh, but to, for us uh, to get a move down to 1448. Uh, silver, you can see on that level where, where it uh, came down to, to trade, obviously I mentioned I, I got long near and around this level obviously this has, has got a hold really uh, you would say for, for me to be ultra confident uh, in it looking over at oil longer term little grind over the last few weeks those areas of support still something to keep an eye on just from the middle of the summer uh, to then October as well up to where we're trading now has been so key uh, last week you can see the breakdown area here looking middle of September before we finally pushed lower on the 24th didn't get a close above there how significant is that going to be 
uh, also worth having a trend on from those lows whether we can uh, get down to test that at all this week or not time will will uh, will tell next key level to the upside I'd say is $60 so here looking at that daily chart 57 64 uh, and obviously those highs from last week very key and worth keeping an eye on looking on that intraday putting those pivots on for a bit more direction you can see just how every time we come up to that area we just cannot close above so something to keep an eye on and a watch on uh, going forward uh, certainly uh, as well maybe more intraday obviously to get anywhere near that 58 we'd have to get through quite a key level which has acted as support as you see on Friday resistance in the early hours 56.95 five cent away from the 57 dollar handle and we are starting to perhaps get a nice little trend form in here so this is definitely something now just having a, a spot of this that I keep an eye on ideally though you want that volume in the afternoon to, to get a decent break of that uh, we'll get the strategy report out obviously closer to midday um, but any questions before that obviously please do uh, let us know hope you'll have a, a good trading day and even better week ahead.